Are we Wait, live on there YouTube? Yeah. Oh. Um, no, you're perfect. You're not live. Yeah, you're perfect. What's going to be this? Please, everybody help us <laughs> out with some drinks and snacks. <laughs> so where does Kai Chi? I'll be deserving of the kids. Good evening, everyone. This is the Human Rights and Equity Commission meeting. Um, we're going to start in a, about five minutes. There's we're a waiting for, for folks to get here. So thank you for your patience. We'll be right back in five minutes. Close enough. And then the chair. Oh.
another five more minutes. Getting it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. All right. Well, thank you so much for your patience. It is 4.10 p.m. Welcome. land acknowledgement, approve the minutes, and then we'll spend the most of our time doing welcome and introduction and really getting to know each other. And then we'll talk about roles and responsibilities as a commissioner, and that's going to be really high level. And then we'll do chair nominations and election process. We'll have Sarah Hudson from the Community Development um, Department. She's going to have an invitation for you to participate in the um, in this stakeholder group. And then we'll have a Exciting update regarding the Director of Equity Department recruitment and then public comment and adjourn. So I'll get started with the roll call. I'll call out your name and if you could just say present. 
Mm-hmm. The meeting starting at 4.40. You mentioned it was 4.10. Oh, pardon. 4.40. <laughs> Started at 4.40. Um, okay, so roll call. On Zoom, we have Commissioner Renee Ruiz. Here. Thank you. In person in the room, we have Commissioner Cameron Fisher. Um, Commissioner Carolyn Peacock Biggs. Present. Commissioner Aaron Marr. Here. Commissioner Jasmine Wilder. Here. Commissioner Jeff Kitchens. Present. Commissioner Joanne Mina. Present. Commissioner Linda Long. Present. Commissioner Sergio Retamal. Present. And missing absent tonight, they provided notice is um, Commissioner Manoj Alipuria, Commissioner Mo Mitchell, and Commissioner Steph Steven Segal. And um and Brittany, Commissioner Brittany Brown might still be here. I haven't heard from her yet. So to um, do the honors of land acknowledgement is Commissioner Carolyn. Oh, pardon me, Cameron Fisher. Okay. We would like to acknowledge that the beautiful, oh yeah, same thing. Okay. We would like to acknowledge that the beautiful land known as Bend, Oregon, north to the Columbia River is the original homeland of the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs. The Confederated Tribes ceded this land in the Treaty of 1855 while retaining regular and customary hunting, fishing, and gathering rights. The Wanalama, Warm Springs, Wasco, Wasco, and Northern Paiute people inhabited this area in certain seasonal times that clearly established their presence. It is also important to note that the Klamath Trail ran north through this region to the Great Celilo Falls trading grounds. This trade route expanded the impact of commerce between tribal nations. We acknowledge and thank the original stewards of this land. It is our hope that guests continue to honor and care for this land. Thank you so much. Next is we're gonna approve the minutes from December 14th. That'll be the current members who were on um, at that meeting. Um, if somebody could say motion to approve and second it and all that in favor to say aye. Or if any changes, let me know as well. Motion to approve. And I second that. All right. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Thank you. Unanimous. Approved. Um, and then so now we're going to spend um, an hour and 15 minutes or more regarding um, all of you. We just want to get to know everybody. Welcome and introduce everybody. A little bit of context. When I came on board in October, there was desire from the commissioners to get to know each other. You know, you're making all these big decisions together and you don't know each other. So we started doing lunch dates and we um, we have laws about public meetings and public records and ethics. So during those lunches, it's really no shop talk and it's really just getting to know each other. And we don't even talk about city business. And since then, I have um Seen like we have become a team. We've developed this relationship, this respect and trust with each other. And there's going to be times, you know, when in this um, group and this community um, commission, there's going to be uncomfortable conversations and there's going to be, you know, impactful decisions and systemic changes you're going to be making together. So it's really great to be in a room where you know each other and you're working together as a team. And you can have that safe space and you can have that like, you know, space to agree to disagree, but yet you're still working together towards a common purpose. So for this particular um, meeting, it really is, you know, taking the time to get to know each other. And then eventually at some point, you know, hopefully we could go get pizza and have a no shop talk lunch date. Um, for this one, if um, what I'm, I'll do is I'll start and and then I'll pass it on. I'll choose somebody to go next, and that person will choose somebody else to go next. Um, for this one, if you could please introduce yourself and say your pronouns, um, you could share anything that you want us to know about you. You know, it could be about your diversity, equity, inclusion, accessibility, DEIA, lived in a work experience, a fun fact about you. Um, it could be a background about your work and or committees, commissions, or boards. And I put it up there so you you know you could be prompted. And when I was sharing this with people, they're like, gosh, that would be so nice. Then I could know about their strengths, you know, and what, what I could um, learn from them. And then for the committees, commissions, and boards, they're like, wow, wouldn't that be great? Because sometimes, you know, people bring up stuff that might be county related and we could have that network in the county or it might be state related. We could have that committee, you know, with the state. So um, this is really um, 
so much opportunity to share that and have us get to know you that way. So I'll start. Um, a fun fact about me is I was born and raised in the Philippines, and I moved here to America when I was 15 years old. And I lost my accent right away because I wanted to. Um, and I have experienced racism and discrimination um, because of the color of my skin. And then my family experienced housing discrimination and um, education disparity because of our um, low socioeconomic status. Um, I've been, for work, I have a background in the private sector and also the public sector. For the private sector, I've worked in media, technology, and creative industries. And then in the public sector, I've always worked in the city government, local government working for the city manager and um, working on strategic initiatives that are important to council or the city manager. And it doesn't necessarily fall into a department or program. But it's important to the city, it's a priority. So like, for example, some, some things that I've worked on, modernizing the way we engage with the community, emergency management. Um, I was an emergency management person, um, houselessness, ad hoc American Rescue Plan Act programs. And now I'm here with you you know, I have the honor of being your interim director. I've always worked on like DEI work from like a program project or issue level. It's not like here, which is really amazing. It's like at the core of everything we do, it's something that council is prioritizing. Um, Mayor Megan Perkins, she's, she just left her for a second. She ran on her platform was about equity and the community voted for her to be on council. So before I even interviewed for this job, I was really impressed that that's something that, you know, the community wanted, the leaders are wanting. They put it in a strategic plan. They put in the goal. They put in the budget. They created resources for it. Um, and it, it's just so exciting for me that they're continuing that. And uh, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Perkins will share with you what um, you did with your work plan that when where it is today at status, the fruits of your labor with regards to the strategic plan. Um, so I'm really excited I get to work with you on this. And um, another one last thing I want you all to know about me is that um, I thought I was gonna be a California girl and then I met and fell in love with an Oregonian and here I am in Oregon. <laughs> and my husband, Jason and I have two horses, two dogs and a barn cat. <laughs> so I'll pass it on to Cassandra. Thank you, Mickey. Um, I'm Cassandra Kehoe. So I currently am working with the city of Bend as the accessibility and equity uh, manager. Um, it's my sixth week, so it's very new. And prior to being with the city, I worked for Saving Grace as a violence prevention specialist. And prior to that, uh, my background is I'm an attorney and I've worked really um, closely in discrimination law, specifically administrative and, and institutions of higher education. So Anything when we're looking at Title Seven or Nine, um, those are kind of my strengths and backgrounds um, of work that I've done before. Um, I am so excited to be working with the city and moving forward with accessibility and equity. Um, that's something that I think is uh, that has been paramount in not only being part of HR previously, but also being able to move through um, and, and work in the city and ensure that the kind of um, policy recommendations and the work plan that HR puts into effect I can be part of to making sure that we're making the city of Bend, Bend as a whole more accessible, more equitable for all of us. So that's very exciting. Um, fun fact, I have two great Pyrenees and they collectively weigh over 300 pounds. So a lot of dog, not as quite as much as a horse, Mickey, but um, that's me in a nutshell. Um, and I also work with Lisa really closely, which I'm very um, glad to be doing in addition to Mickey. So with that, I will, um, I'll throw it over to Sergio. Uh, Sergio, what am I? Um, uh, fun fact, I do have a corgi, so uh, 35 pounds. Hair, hair. I've been bent for four years. Uh, my uh, uh, board experience, I have been in two boards, one for 10 years as a, uh, for the Hispanic Foundation of Silicon Valley. So I was there for 10 years. I started as a, board, as a member, then I was the chair for two. I also was on uh, Teenager Success, which is a, a small organization, mostly helping young mothers that uh, were pregnant at 12, from 12 to 16, so helping them go back to high school and hopefully to college. Uh, I'm a business owner. I have my own business for uh, 18 years. Uh, I travel uh, a good amount of time, 50% of the time, so some of the times I'll be, be assumed some of the time be here. 
Um, in that said, who do you want to pass it on to? Uh, let's go with uh, Jess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeff Kitchens. Uh, pronouns are he, him. And uh, fun fact, um, I'm a huge outdoor enthusiast uh, and regularly enjoy wandering landscapes off trail. So I do that quite a bit in my, my entire life. Um, so a uh, little bit of background for me in terms of DEIA work. Uh, I have for over a decade, I work for the, well, sorry, I worked for the federal government, um, Department of Interior. I've been in public land management now for uh, over 20 years. And I started in wildland firefighting and worked in all different levels and sectors of public lands. And as part of that also for over a decade, I've been a diversity change agent for the Department of Interior, uh, hosting and supporting local regions. Are we good? Yeah. No, you can mute yours. Thank you so much for that. Perfect. Are we good? Can you hear me now? Not April. All right. <laughs> Just kidding. No. <laughs> All right. Good afternoon, um, everyone. It's a pleasure and an honor to be uh, with all of you here virtually and in person. Uh, my name is Joanne Mina. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to uh, for the public to get to know who are the folks that represent them and their interests. Um, so a little fun fact about me. This fun fact you share was not fun, so I'm going to share fact that it's not fun either. <laughs> um, I, well, I went to the doctor on Friday, and they told me that I could be a uh, candidate for early cataracts. Oh. Uh, so uh, a PSA announcement. <laughs> if you're driving at night and you notice that the yes. lights... Uh, you know, have a little, uh, look a little different. Yeah. Talk to your doctor. About it. <laughs> uh, because it could mean that you are a candidate for early oh, when Right you. here. I got these right here because the reason. <laughs> and I have my club. Well, that's why you have to check your ophthalmology. Um, you know, but that's a little fun fact. Uh, my surprise on Friday. 
Um, but um, on a more serious uh, level, um, my experience, uh, I guess, advocated for by some of my community comes back from childhood. Um, I remember vividly the invasion of the United States Army in Panama and the subsequent um, economic fallout uh, from that. Um, and since then, you know, I have learned to, uh, I have learned the, the power of civic engagement. And also I have um, gained that great understanding that democracy is not a um, standstill uh, activity, but more like an ongoing, ever-changing uh, process. Um, so I, I also, like Jeff, I was engaged uh, on the uh, equity task force and helping uh, create this space. Um, professionally, I have worked uh, in the service industry, uh, cleaning tables and serving drinks and bringing food to folks. Uh, so I appreciate uh, all of our hospitality workers here in Ben. Um, and I have also had the opportunity uh, to serve um, in different nonprofits and in different uh, committees and commissions. Uh, I think that some that are relevant uh, that have really um, helped uh, inform this work has been the 2020 Wildfire Recovery Council, simply because that brought a level of uh, inequity in a flash. So a lot of learnings yeah. came, came from there. And um, I am currently also serving in the Health Equity Advisory Leaders Group. Um, and to me, that is impactful because uh, we know that uh, immigrant Oregonians experience uh, exclusions at uh, many levels. Uh, so like healthcare in particular is one that uh, impacts the whole family. Uh, so I look forward to be able to advocate in that space and to bring those learnings into here. Uh, even if healthcare is not something the city does, we know that um, our, 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 our communities don't uh, silo their issues, but that, you know, we carry everything with us. Uh, so that is a little bit about me and it's a pleasure to be here. I will pass it on to... Um, who wants to go? Jasmine. I didn't want to put you in the spot. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I don't know much long time <laughs> before I have to put it in. <laughs> um, you can see we're warming up. Slowly but surely. It's the pain. <laughs> right? Um, so my name is Jasmine Wilder, and um, I have been on the Human Rights and Equity Commission since it launched. And I have served as the chair of the Human Rights and Equity Commission. And so um, I don't know, fun fact about me that seems super relevant right now is I'm a foster mom. And I have four kids currently, which was an accident. <laughs> I promise. Oh, also I have she or her pronouns. Um and I I been a foster mom since 2020, and it is a huge part of what I do with my day and my life and my energy. Um, another huge part of what is my professional job, and I am a marketing manager for a national nonprofit called School Board Partners, which works to transform public education by training and supporting and resouring the um, the the elected school board members across the country, showing them how to strategically use their power and to <laughs> yeah. really participating now. <laughs> you see, you get a me, huh? yeah. 
<laughs> one for each hand. <laughs> um, teaching them how to uh, create equity and um, really kind of remove the archaic systems of the past in education that have really maintained uh, an, an equitable uh, yeah. educational experience for our K through 12 children. Um, so this common theme in my life does feel to be children. Um, and there's huge things that I feel like really cause us as a country to continue on in some of the really um, deep, you know, generational pain that we have. And that's, you know, the community of the home and then the community of the school. And so those, that would feel like the common thread as far as where my passions lie um, is figuring out what, what ways have we systemized a lot of these um, inequities, what we pass on to the children and, 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 you know, and cause it to be that they have less opportunities and more barriers and it's more difficult for them to become, you know, a fully engaged and connected adults <laughs> who thrive. Um, and I think taking a look at the foster care system and like taking a look at the education system, like I feel like my heart's been broken over and over again, as well as, um, you know, put back together. <laughs> and like, and I am constantly like reminded about like why I sit where I want to sit and as discouraging as it is, I'm also incredibly encouraged to like put my hand to things like this um, and to be around like-minded individuals and to, you know, kind of get that fresh energy and fresh um, air that comes from doing this type of work in the Bend community um, of, you know, being concerned about housing inequities and, and what folks' experience are as we like grow and expand <laughs> and get larger and more diverse which is exciting. Um, I also am just happy to kind of have the, the opportunities for, lead, for leading in that type of way. So that's me. I don't know if I left anything out. I have a couple of other boards that I sit on, affordable housing, foster care, um, and also political activism. So helping actually at the state level um, and all the way down <laughs> for our elected officials to get to the place where we wanted to be. Yeah. Did you sleep? <laughs> no, I don't actually. <laughs> and this is Leo, everybody. <laughs> this two year old birthday will be in April. Our honorary. Yes, honorary commissioner. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's a cutie. Do you want to pass it on to All you? All right. I will pass it on to Erin. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, hello. Uh, I'm Erin Meyer. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I'm mostly just feeling so honored to be in a room with people who have such amazing experience and are doing such important work um, and have done such important work in the past. Uh, I am queer and trans. Um, and that is the primary DEI lived experience that I that I'm bringing. Um, I uh, have never served on a committee or commission before, um, but I have previously worked with the city of Cambridge and their um, in the city government, um, which was a great experience. Definitely learned a lot. Um, and other than that, I uh, have spent a lot of time with Joanne in the service industry and have a lot of um, yeah. <laughs> Have a lot of respect for that work. Um, I briefly thought that I was going to be an academic and my area of uh, study was around communities and how um, small structural changes in communities can have such a big impact on the way people feel in them and feel like they can participate or not participate. Um, and particularly around uh, uh, queerness, transness, gender, race, all of that fun stuff. Um, and when I left academia and 
went into food service. After that, I kind of moved into structural operations work. So I keep that uh, the details and the processes and the procedures kind of perspective is kind of where I tend to do most of my work. Um, right now, I work for a local company that works with farmers to distribute food throughout the area. Um, but I am excited to be able to participate more um, community and yeah, excited to be here. Oh, fun fact. Uh, there is an intersection in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where my voice is the voice saying, you are now free to cross Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Both one of them is me, so that's like fine. Yeah. Um, I don't think I left anything out. Uh, all right, how about Carolyn? Yeah. I'm Carolyn Peacock Biggs. I've been in Oregon. Uh, next month will be one official year. And yes, my fun fact will be I found out Saturday uh, I was in Madison on a celebration of life. And I found out that I loved cows. <laughs> I do. I think I need to have a ranch or something. I don't know. But I love cows. And I've been watching many cow videos about cows since Saturday. I'm so excited about meeting people that have cows. It's my newest thing that I've learned that about me that I didn't know that I love cows. Many words, presently. And I didn't know cows had fur like this thing. I thought they were like like, like horses when you brush them. I don't cats. Yes. But they're they have fur. So I learned that and that was my fun fact. So now I'm a cow person and I probably will spend some time on a ranch and I may name a calf at some point, hopefully. Wait until you find out about yaks. Yeah. <laughs> What's a yak? <laughs> Yeah, it's good on you. Good for you. You're oh, okay. <laughs> well, um, I'm sure you've caught my southern draw by now. I'm from Georgia and I don't hide it. And yes, my plates say California, but I am not from California. <laughs> um, I was in Santa Barbara four years before I came here. That's why I have the California license plate. But I southern bred, as they call us grits, girls raised in the South. So and let's see. Um I've been here long enough to know that there's certain things that I'm passionate about and there's certain things that kind of kind of rub me sideways a little bit, but I am passionate and I noticed about the housing crisis out here. That is something that I noticed coming from Santa Barbara. It's almost as if it's the same market, only here. And it's almost like we've gotten to a point where we have almost priced our service workers out of the city because they can't afford to live here unless they want to live like college students in five deep. And who as an adult wants to live with four or five people just to maintain the average lifestyle? But I, I just had to say that. But as far as board experience, I have um, been on the board of the Kiwanis International. I've been on, I've chaired boards with um, First United Methodist Church and very active in my church. Um, I taught, oh, let me give you a backstory. Um, my master's is in social work with an emphasis in mental health and a sub-concentration in military culture. Uh, the government taught me about PTSD, substance, and trauma, so I know a little bit about that. I, So I was a chairperson for the garden preschool. So I have a tendency to dim in things that matter as a whole. People sometimes ask me, well, what made you become a social worker? And I tell them that I've always been one. Ever since I was a little girl, I could always look at a problem or hear a problem and the solution will be somewhere rolling around in my head. So I've always been a problem solver, even at an early age. Um, I've been in hospital social work for over 10 years. And that is one of the most passionate things you ever want to do because I get I get to help people uh, make it to transition. And that is one of the most tender, delicate moments in someone's life that you 
actually feel like you've accomplished. You have made a difference today. And it's a difference that passes generation. It's a multi-generational job where you go from not only are you helping the patient, done well, you'll help the parents. And done well, you'll help the parents' children because everybody's in the room. So you'll look up and there's four generations of people that just don't see death the way they did when you first got here. Mm -hmm. And it's just beautiful because our nation has a tendency to want to put end of life people over there, let somebody else take care of it. And it's just as natural as birth, only opposite. Mm -hmm. And once we see it as such, it's easier to stay in the room when they transition. Um, see, um, as far as my skill set, I think if I have to say what I do best, I would say conflict resolution. My leadership skills are very strong. And I manage quite a few people in hospice. Trying to manage social workers probably like her cat. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I absolutely all that <laughs> it's wonderful but it's it's been a pleasure so far working with the commission and just being the voice of people that are not quite the status quo I don't really talk about pronouns for me because I'm she, her, if, if that matters to anybody. But I want to be passionate about the invisible population. I want to be a voice for people that don't have a way to say what they feel safely. I'd like to give them a place to be emotionally safe. And I'd like to pass the talk. Oh, wait, sorry. You were saying you taught something. You're like, oh, let me give you a background. What did you, what do you? Oh, okay. Um, when my mother got sick and I had to go back to Georgia to take care of her, she was at a point where she ended up doing hospice. And I decided I didn't want to do hospice while I was taking care of my mom because that's way too much hospice. So I taught at um, Fort Valley State University, which is an HBC. And for those who don't know what HBC stands for, Historical Black College. That was a wonderful experience. I taught undergrad, um, social work classes, community organization. I taught gerontology, death and dying. Mm -hmm. And to witness being in a historically Black college, because I did not attend one. I'm a USC, don't shoot me, Trojan. <laughs> <laughs> don't Trojan, spot on. And, <laughs> and to be a part of the economic structure of segregation 101 at its finest. It's it's it was amazing because there there are social there are socially different things you need to do for different types of people. We want to say, well, I don't see color, I don't you do, even if you have early stages of cataract. <laughs> you do, you do. And it's okay because you should, because like there's colors on our clothes, we see them, and it's okay. And some of us need a little more help than others. And, you know, I was first generation of college in my family and there was no roadmap. So it's nice to have a place where people can help you. And I've, I've gotten to a point where I can help people. I said, this is, this is an easy way to do it because I had to fumble and step over rocks and knock myself down and put band-aids on my knees or cry late at night trying to write a paper when I, didn't really learn how to write in high school. I had to learn how to write while I'm writing. So yeah, it's it's beautiful to be that voice and that little bit of of, of presence. People who are totally invisible, and I'm 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 so grateful to have an opportunity to be able to be racially sensitive, and I could address a lot of. It's, and especially here, I might see what maybe one or two black people a month. It's not that many. It's nice to be represented here and be able to be a voice of people. Let's pass it to oh Cameron, she's right here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm Cameron Fisher, and my pronouns are she, her. Um, and I grew up in Oregon and I came back to Oregon to land in Bend in 2004. And 
I am so thrilled to see the changes that have happened over nearly 20 years, this um, progress of things like this commission and other things emerging and shifts in council and shifts in school board, et cetera. So I, it's just been really um, a neat shift over the last nearly 20 years. And so a um, little bit about me, um, fun fact, I was, in, uh, I was a special education teacher and um, was in the world of special ed for 10 years um, in California, Arizona, and Oregon. And out of that, that chunk of time came kind of this realization on disproportionalities and disparities um, in lots of different ways with diverse abilities and the BIPOC community and socioeconomic background. Um, and uh, after I finished off my 10 years in special education, I moved on to uh, want to have my own kids and it was a little hard to do that at the same time. So I um, am teaching in higher ed and I'm, I teach for Oregon State. Um, both Cascades and also um, Corvallis through eCampus. Um, and uh, I teach for a uh, Department of um, Human Development and Family Sciences and our College of Public Health and, and Sciences and also for elementary education. Uh, and very much, I think, after my experience in K-12, um, very much with an equity lens uh, with my students who go on to be social service providers and, and educators. Um, so it's it's kind of a, a a really um, important element for my teaching um, is to to share what I learn and um, and what I think students need to go back out to, to go into the community and um, the educational realm to 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 be advocates and allies, um, if not um, connecting their lived experience with um, what they learn and then what they go on to do. Um, and uh, Fun fact: I'm a parent of two teens, and I love it. Um, I know it's 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 challenging, but it's a really great time to be a parent, and I, it's it's not what I expected. Um, and so that's a uh, fun fact. Uh, way I stay connected with regard to my community beyond work and commission. I'm involved in a couple other um, boards um, and committees um, connected to. Um, equity in the school systems, um, behavioral health, um, and restorative justice, uh, and bring that into the schools um, and our community. And I guess that's kind of it in a nutshell. And I'm really happy to be here. And I think this is a fantastic group of people. And I can pass on to Linda. Oh, if you'd be willing. <laughs> I knew I would get to. <laughs> So I'm Linda Long. Um, fun fact, uh, my last name's gonna change very fast and I can't wait because that's not my last name. Uh, my last name is Metz, but I'm not gonna, that was my dad's name. I'm gonna honor my mom who died in name too by taking her maiden name. Okay. So I'm gonna be Linda Elwood. Nice. And this one's going bye-bye. <laughs> I hate that name. Um, so, I was born and bred in Minnesota. I am pure northerner. Spent some time in North Carolina. They didn't like me very much. <laughs> so um, I lived in two places, Elgin, Illinois, and Minneapolis, basically, between two families and Highway 94. Elgin was a segregated place, old, very, very old. It was built before Chicago, um, cut through Pearl River. Four lived on one side, uh, middle class lived on the other, the doctors lived on the hill, <laughs> you know, kind of place. Um, the only black kid I ever knew uh, at growing up, oh, just for some odd reason, kept on wanting to chase me up trees. So then uh, I turned 20 and I left to for Minneapolis uh, to take care of my other mom and ended up going to school, even though they wouldn't let me in for some of my flight. Um, uh, I took extension courses for a year and that next year they let me in. I went to school originally for architecture, got there and decided, mm, no, they don't have the answers. Ended up in urban studies, which was singularly the most comprehensive, all encompassing uh, framework for a study that I know about. 
So, um, so did that. I became a student activist. I met the world, basically. I uh, got to travel to Mexico for over 10 years, back and forth for months at a time. So I learned Spanish. I didn't go as a tourist. I went as a guest to a, for, of a family. Um, so I was extremely lucky and really learned about a lot about uh, what it means to be an American, uh, you know, once I left. Mm-hmm. Once I left, I uh, became a student activist. I uh, was one of a very small group of people who started the uh the conversation at the University of Minnesota, which is where I went to school, um, to create a cultural pluralism requirement, 12 credits of courses um, in the four major uh, um, ethnic categories. Uh, They're not studying each individual. Apparently they call it social justice, but it started in uh, mid uh, 80s, late 80s, based on that conversation. We were the first university in the country to pass the cultural pluralism in the towns. Um, and I did a number of other things, basically just, you know, really got to know the world and how really unfair it was. Um, I was really privileged in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways, not really. I couldn't do math when I got school. The only thing I could do was read. So um, I took advantage of the programs that they had at the time. Fast forward, uh, it took me a little bit longer to graduate than I wanted it to. I ended up doing 30 years of executive admin in corporations, nonprofits, and um, smaller uh, uh, businesses. Um, I did work for the Metropolitan Council while they were doing their 2030 blueprint. That was a really interesting process. Um, Really a a deep dive into uh, community involvement. Um, even played games like Monopoly style games to collect information from the community. That was a, a, an incredible um, experience. Um, took care of all my duties and finally uh, 60 arrived at my doorstep. All of a sudden I'm 50 years old and I decided, okay, you know what, I'm done. Done with my duties. And for the first time in my life, I got to decide where I would live for myself, by myself without anybody else's needs um, impacting that. And I decided on Oregon. And I landed on, I planned it meticulously for eight months because I'm a planner by profession and personality. Um, And landed April 2nd, 2020 became instantaneously homeless because everything shut down. Hostels, all my plans went up. So, I found an Airbnb that was a chicken yard in Clackamas and they rented me a space for $9 uh, a night and lent me a tent and uh, did that for six months. Finally, with the stimulus, I worked for Starbucks. They bought me out uh, because I couldn't work because COVID, my age, and a pacemaker. Um, and I bought a camper trailer because I it was the most creative solution I could think of in 1966 a companion, only eight years older than me. <laughs> and I stayed in the chicken yard for a whole nother year uh, till I could buy a truck. And then I bought a truck and then I had to learn how to pull it, <laughs> which is a very exciting process because I hadn't driven for 18, 20 years because I lived in Minneapolis yeah. and you don't have to drive in Minneapolis mm-hmm. at any point. So uh, to go anywhere, anytime. <laughs> so I had to relearn how to drive, learn to pull the thing. I ended up uh, in a couple of communities of uh, Medford, I didn't, I came to Bend because it was the most logical thing to do and it was a beautiful town. Yeah. Um, now, uh, I've seen both sides of the homeless issue. I've been in China Hat, I've been homeless in Bend for three years. Um, some on Mountain and some in China Hat. So now I've seen it from both ends. I've lost two friends, mm-hmm. almost three. That's another story. Um, but, uh, it's very, and it's brought me back to what I really wanted to do in the first place, which, uh, is, which was make an impact, um, and make it better and be other focused and other focused, uh, other by other, I mean, the ones who get lost in the whole mess, right. And don't get, don't get counted aren't able to be or don't want to or have given up 
right? So my focus and my passion is really grassroots. Um, I'm starting a nonprofit called Epic Actions, um, enhancing uh, positive initiatives in community. I want to uh, encourage and create buy-in from the homeless community um, and create opportunities for ownership. I want this new equity framework to include um, a, a process and a, and, a, and a support system for uh, for very small businesses, nonprofits that started by homeless ourselves, so that we can reach out and extend the the activities that are already happening. I think the only hole is that we're not helping, right? We're not helping, so. Um, I think we have to talk about what community, we have to have another discussion about what community is, because that, like everything else since the pandemic, um, it's changing, it's changing. And just because it's transient, just because it's it changes continually and turns over, doesn't mean it's not a community. Yes. Just because it's not in one, there's other things that link us as a community other than knowing each other. Definitely. So... That's that's my focus. Fun fact: I speak Spanish and I play the djembe. Mm. Don't ask me how that happened. <laughs> just uh, I, you know, and the congas. But uh, yeah, I just uh, I came from a very white place and then uh, left it and discovered the rest of the world and loved it. <laughs> so that's me in a nutshell. If you could tell a person in a nutshell. <laughs> And so, it, it, who's it? Who's not in it yet? Zabi. There's Renee online, Zabi, Mayor uh, right. Okay, Zabi, just because I think your name is really cool. <laughs> um, I'm Zabi Borja. You just go by Zabi. Uh, you see your pronouns. And actually, on the name related, it was something I've been kind of thinking about too, kind of really kind of my story from address. Uh, but I've always gone by Zabi just because I felt it was easier for teachers growing up. I mean, teachers were quite in our way. Right. And so again, it's embodied that, but I, I don't mind Zavi, uh, but it was something that I've just like thought of. But an interesting fact or a fun fact is that I did dance for 10 years. I did ballet and jazz and hip hop for like 10 years. I uh, really enjoyed it. Um, I still do enjoy it, but um, that's a fun fact. So I am your uh, communication, uh, I'm your communication um, department liaison. Uh, so I'm a community relations manager with an emphasis on partnerships and equity. And so I'm really external facing. Um, and I think my role is starting to, I've been here about a little over a year now, I'm still learning a ton. I feel like I'm still been like on week six, still, <laughs> whatever it is, right? Um, I think I'm really starting to understand, I come from grassroots as well. So coming into a municipality has been really different for me, um, and I'm still learning an absolute ton in terms of process, policy, again, especially external facing and being external with community and working with specifically community outreach and engagement. Uh, so developing and working on processes to kind of standardize that for the org. Uh, so we're not kind of one off and siloed within certain departments. Um, my DEI journey. So again, I'm from Madras, so a very rural, pretty fairly conservative town. Um, it wasn't until I moved to San Francisco for about two and a half years. That is when I was really keen to this concept of DEI. Um, and it was just like a light switch of like, oh, like a lot of like my upbringing. So my, both my parents are from Mexico. Uh, so like a lot of my like lived experience was just my normal. Uh, so I didn't really think about it in terms of like a DEI lens. And I realized that not only within that, I mean, again, my parents are from Mexico, so like I have citizenship. And so really taking that into account for myself, like a positionality to be able to do something with that. And naturally I'm from this area. I love the outdoors. And I came back from SF and started a nonprofit on the South side, um, which still runs right now. And I mean, I've worked all the way from Jamba Juice, the Safeway here, Boy and Girls Club, Summit High School, um, Parks District and a host of different um, programs um, to now work for the city event. And this position opened up and a colleague, Joshua Romero, uh, sent it on LinkedIn and was like, hey, you know, we've never met. Uh, I think this is really cool what you're doing. If you know anybody that's interested in this position, let me know. And I looked at it and I was like, wow, I think I'm doing a lot of this stuff already. Um, I'd love to apply. And I think it just goes to show the city's strides in what this looks like. And it's going to take a lot of time and I think for me, coming from that grassroots has been a huge um, key lens for me to keep um, as we do this work, because it is really tough. 
and municipalities, and we have a very progressive um, and a very uh, supportive council and leadership. Um, but it's been, it takes a lot of time. And I think for me personally, I'm very impatient. Um, it's been difficult, but also been really real to sit in. And it's funny because uh, Perkins and I had a meeting, I remember like in 2019, you know, just starting all yep. this stuff. So I was like, I'm going to start this nonprofit. And she was like, I think I'll run for city council. <laughs> <laughs> It was at that same time where I was like, I'm contemplating, so I sit on the, our parks board, uh, which is a separate entity, right, from our center level, or not from Ben, but like, we have a unique system to where our parks district is its own thing. So I sit on the parks board, and I chair the um, Latino Community Association and a handful of other uh, boards here in the community. And that's me. So who do you want to pass it on to? We got Renee. Renee. Yeah. Renee. 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 Hi, everybody. I'm going to try to turn my camera on. I've been having some wonky tech issues, but we're going to try it. Um, there you are. Yeah, I am, kind of. Weird lighting, <laughs> but we're going to try it. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Renee, and I have been sitting here listening to, like, all of these amazing stories, and I was trying to come up with my own. So um, here it goes. Um, so uh, my husband and I have lived in Bend for about four years. And I'm going to go ahead and shut that camera off because it seems a little bit distracting and weird. Um, <laughs> um, we love you. There, there we go. Um, so uh, lived here for about four years, brought my husband along with me. I'm originally from Kansas um, and have uh, worked in social justice, mainly in the, ma the labor movement all across the country from um, South Florida and little tiny towns in West Virginia um, on tribal lands in Arizona, um, throughout Nevada, California. And I even did eight months in Zuccotti Park in New York during the Occupy Wall Street movement. Um, and then um, I was recruited to come to Bend for um, the Oregon Nurses Association. And my background is in um, um, uh, labor, particularly with nursing and healthcare and um, collective bargaining and uh, representation. Um, and, but I started in the labor movement doing um, advocacy, uh, legislative advocacy, government relations, and that type of work. And I just, um, I've just changed jobs. And so that's kind of why I'm not in the, the, room, the room today. I'm kind of in the middle of, of training. Um, I, I've gone to work for National Nurses United, um, we, who, who doesn't, we don't represent facilities here in Oregon, but there is a lot of work. Um, uh, one of the reasons that I decided to move back to National Nurses United, I'd worked for them years ago, was because they have a real um, footprint of social justice and advocacy outside of the workplace. Um, and they have a really um, active, conscious social, social justice, um, fairness and equity, um, work that they do around the country. And so my focus is going back to government relations policy and um, advocacy in that way and, and not as much as working directly in the shops with healthcare workers, which I do love um, and is what brought me here to Bend. Um, and Let's see. Um, I, as I said, I worked. I worked with social justice advocacy, um, all of these things for going on twenty years, um, and um, for the last twelve have been focused in, you know, almost exclusively in the labor movement. Um, but I do have passion projects are my that are my own outside of like what my um, full time job hat are and and um, or is and. One of them really is um, healthcare should be a right, not a privilege of wealth. And the disparity, particularly in healthcare, that um, found really, really um, alarming. Um, not only is there the wealth barrier, but there's also the uh, marginalized community barrier in real healthcare and um, being able to advocate for patients in a real way. 
Um, so that there is, if you have access to healthcare, are you really getting equitable healthcare in, inside the, the door? Um, and so that's been a passion project of mine for a while. Um, and I'm hoping to get to work and do more expansion on that since I've taken on more of a policy and advocacy role than, than direct representation. Um, let's see, fun fact about me. I don't know how, how much fun I am. I feel like my nose is always in a book and I'm always reading or arguing a point. Um, but at the beginning of the pandemic, I decided to take on something that was just for me, and it's kind of a hill that I wanted to climb that really had no relevance to my work. It wasn't going to get me farther up the ladder or anything like that. But um, in 2020, I started a, um, a paralegal degree program. And so I'm in my last semester. So working 60 to 70 hours a week, and then um, I spend every Sunday from um, early, early in the morning to late in the evening um, actually doing my schoolwork. But this is my last semester, so I'm very excited to actually be done um, with that, and hopefully I'm going to be able to put that um, to some good use um, working on, you know, volunteering some of my practice time um, within the community, um, particularly around like um, access to affordable housing, um, immigration status, and all of these things that I felt that were my passion project. And now I actually have a tangible thing that I can offer and, and help with um, the attorneys to kind of um, make this road easier and better. Um, and so, I'm really excited about being able to actually do that. And um, the one thing that I would say that I um, knew virtually nothing about Oregon and I was enticed to come here to Bend because I was really excited about the work with the, the healthcare system that's here in Oregon for the nurses. I was very excited about that. And of course, like I said, I grew up you know, fishing, camping, all of those things in Kansas. So I'm like, this is great. And I came here and I met amazing people. And I also do want to give a shout out to Megan Perkins, who's the first one that was like, hey, do you want to volunteer to do some of this stuff? And so pulled me in. And um, I think she's probably heard me say this before. Leaders are not always born, they're um, cornered. And so <laughs> just kind of something that happened. Um, but the one thing, and, and you know, had this conversation uh, with, with folks, some of the folks around the table before, like I was shocked by the lack of diversity and the polite racism and bigotry that I found here. Like I'd been all over the country and worked and like with so many diverse people. And I came here and I was really like, oh, wow. I haven't experienced this since I was a kid in Kansas. Like what, like, and so being able to be part of this and figure out a solution um, really is something that drives me. And I'm really excited to be at this table with all these other brilliant folks um, to kind of add to the conversation and, and move stuff forward. So I really appreciate you all. And I wish I were there with you. And I'm, as soon as I get done training, hopefully I'm gonna be able to actually be in the same space with folks. That's great, Renee. Thank you so much. Now you get to pass it on. We've got um, Mayor Pro Tem, Ian, staff, Stephanie, Lisa, and Juan. Um, how about Juan? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I guess my name is one of the Minutes of serving as a city of Venice IT director. Uh, I think the city since 2020. Um, under the innovation uh, team in the city, um, my job is to support. Uh, Oh, one of one of my jobs is to support public meetings, uh, but also oversee uh, the infrastructure, the infrastructure and the enterprise applications of the city, and provide the best customer service that we can mm -hmm. to our employees, to our council, and ultimately to our community members. Um, 
fun fact about me. Uh, I came to the, the United States when I was 16, finished my senior year, went to college, uh, came to Central Oregon in 2003. So I've been here 19 years. So I've seen a lot of changes and uh, band and Central Oregon in general. It's a great place to be. Thanks for being here to share. Lisa? Hi, I'm Lisa Larson. I, um, I go by Sheeper, and I work for the Accessibility and Equity Commission, or uh, Excellent Committee, uh, our department. Actually, it's a program, isn't it? Yeah, department. Oh. <laughs> Another day. So, yes, I've been here since 2017, which doesn't seem like. But um, uh, I'm now part of the GIA. Department as well, and I um, love my job and I love my bar. Um, and fun fact about me is that I was born and raised, I was born, but I was raised in Portland, Oregon, and um, my father was a professional archer. And I, as a teenager, I won state champion here in Ben. Wow, awesome. That is a fun. That's super cool. <laughs> And Air Pro Tem. And Ian. Ian. Hey everybody, Ian Lighthizer, uh, he, him pronouns. I am one of four lawyers in the city attorney's office. And for those of you who are newer, that's the city of Ben's in-house law firm. We give advice um, to Everybody who works for or represents the city that can and will include all of you in your capacity on this commission. Um, EI lived experience. Uh, I I was probably introduced. It wasn't called DEIA then, but I've lived in Oregon for a long time, and every time I've moved away, I've came back. So. Um, if any of you were in Oregon in the early 1990s, I think Stephanie probably remembers good enough she was. Um, there were a couple of ballot measures in the early 1990s that sought to amend Oregon's constitution to, I think we'd say now, require discrimination against LGBT individuals in the community. So those, those ballot measures, which were defeated, but... Uh, more narrowly than I think they would be today, were probably the things that introduced young me <laughs> to some of these ideas. And I went back as people were talking and actually looked up the language of 1992's Measure 9, and I can't even read it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I thought, oh, I'm going to read this out loud. Because to me, um, reading, yeah, looking at this from 20... 20 years ago? No, 30. God, um, 30 years ago. So it's a long time, but I I can't even I can't even read it out loud. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. um yeah, I look at that and that was that was definitely one of the things that um I wouldn't say opened my eyes because it didn't really change things that young me thought. Um but it was pretty influential. So, um, fun fact about me: uh, I've got two girls, eighteen and fourteen. Eighteen-year-old is off college. Um, we, uh, if I'm not here or sleeping, I'm probably skiing uphill, riding bikes, or running out there, usually by myself. So that's that's how I spend a lot of my time. <laughs> Skiing uphill, it's the only way to ski. Have to ski down. How do you get to ski down? Yeah. yeah, letting somebody else get you up the hill, that's not. That's not cheating. Okay. cheating. So who do you want to pass it to? Uh, how about Stephanie? Thanks to see everyone. I'm Stephanie Betteridge. I have the privilege of serving as the city's chief innovation officer and one of the assistant city managers. And I always like to share a little bit about how we define innovation. It is not about chasing shiny new objects. It's about using data, some technology, but really engaging with people and looking at how we do things. So it's about continuous improvement and being curious. And 
So let's see. Oh, but I forgot my she, her pronouns. I have spent my entire career in public service, even before um, I got a real job. But even when I was in high school, I did search rescue with the county over. I, I grew up in the Lamp Valley in a small town called Camp. So public service is part of who I am. This is not a job for me. This is aligned with my values and my passions. And so anything that I can do to give back to my community and work to improve the lives of those who live here is, is really important to me. I came to the city of Bend from the city of Gresham, which for those of you who are familiar with Gresham is one of the most diverse cities in the state. And it was there that I really learned the importance of PIA and making sure that you are hearing from the from everyone in your community. We all have a really rich and diverse fabric in the communities that we live. And we can only serve our community well when we engage, build relationships, and authentically listen to the needs um, and the wants and incorporate that into how we deliver our services. Um, fun fact about me, see, I said I, I have a cow connection. I <laughs> <laughs> I grew up on a farm in, in Hammy and we had a cow named Molly and I actually had a bummer lance at the fair. We're dressed up in bonnets and <laughs> just um, and Carolyn is now obsessed with you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I can share with you. Um and I have twin boys that are 14. Uh, Megan Perkins, uh, she, her, um, I am called the mayor pro tem, which is a very fancy Latin term for fake mayor. <laughs> if Melanie, you know, keels over, I will take over, I guess. Uh, but the odds of Melanie uh, keeling over, if anyone has ever met Melanie, are, are very low. Um, I, uh, let's see, I was, I was born in Corvallis. I go back six generations in Oregon on both sides of my family. So, um, there's a lot of, a lot of Oregon, um, in my, in my blood. Um, but my family decided to go on an adventure, um, when I turned three and we moved to Boston. And after a couple of years in the suburbs of Boston, my mom said, I cannot do this anymore and let's move into the city and you're going to attend the Boston public schools. And, um, at a time when things were pretty rough still um, in the Boston public schools in terms of busing. Um, and they they were sort of <laughs> reverse busing. And so they would take they would take kids from uh, from outer areas and, and, and have them be go into the city. And there was a lot of controversy about it. So um, and here, you know, here I was going into it with my, you know, my eyes very wide open um, and it changed the course of my life. Um, and I am so grateful for that experience. Um, I grew up with parents that had always been very involved in racial justice work um, from very early on in their own lives. Um, but I think the moment my, my real DEI experience um, started or, or, or passion started um, that uh, my boyfriend at the time, who was black, was running to school because he was late for school and he got arrested because they assumed that he was running from a crime. Um, and I'll never forget sort of that moment in my life of just like being like, what? You know, just not understanding that. Um, and um, have a fun fact about me is I've lived in Boston, uh, let's say Oregon, Boston, Colorado, Boston, Washington, D.C., Cleveland, Madison, Wisconsin, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and now here. Yeah. Um, and um, have seen a lot of really, um, really amazing places all over this country. Um, I was involved. My my background is in, uh, I worked for state government. I worked for campaigns. I worked for the federal government. I worked for a senator. Um, and... Um, I never was really involved in local politics or local um, anything besides sort of just being involved in, in generally in the community until they uh, said that they were going to close my kids' school in Santa Fe. And um, there was a huge, there were huge inequities in the way the school system was run in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And um, my kids' school was 80% uh, non-white, 85% on free and reduced lunch. Um, and I felt that they were, they were, um, doing this, um, because they thought they could get away with it. Um, and so I started organizing and started showing up at 
with hundreds of people and marching and, and doing you know what I could and they didn't close that school. <laughs> um, and uh, then they said, you know, it'd be really nice. And it's, and it's funny now because I feel like um, that's it's kind of karma for me. It would be really nice if people would come to our meetings when there wasn't a crisis and just talk. <laughs> and so I went to every meeting and I talked for you know the, the three minutes that I was allowed to and said, here's what we're doing at the school now. And here's what we're doing at the school now. And it just sort of sparked something with me. Um, and we moved here and um, I have a multiracial family. Two of my children, my three children are, are black. Um, and um, it's it's funny what you say about the, 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 the not seeing color thing. And so we moved here and my, my kids in, you know, meeting new parents and my kids playing soccer and someone says, which one's your kid? And I said, oh, it's, he's the black one right there. And the one on there, <laughs> I said, you know, the, and I was like, well, how else would you like? It just, he's the only black kid out there right now, you know? And it was like, you know, and that was kind of like an intro to me of like, of what it was going to be like here, you know, not talking about that. So um, I co-founded a, a nonprofit called Embrace Bend, which um, really seeks to sort of create a more um, equitable community here and, and safe community. And I actually serve on the board with Renee, which is, um, it's been, like you said, I, I, I pulled her in um, and um, that's been a, it was a really um really incredible way to meet people and to 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 do what I can to sort of help this community and, and support this community, but most importantly, to be an advocate for my kids. And um, I've been on the council since 2020. And so this is sort of going to the second half of, of my term. And I, um, I absolutely love it. And I'm just really, really happy to um, be the liaison to the Human Rights and Equity Commission. And I think we're also going to have um, other counselors like like rotate through too, which I think is really going to be really great too. So they can see all the great work that y'all are doing. Great. Did everybody oh go? Gosh. Did you go? Oh, you went. Okay. I, I feel like we could do this all night. Yeah. Like, I don't want to do anything else. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for sharing yourselves with each other. Um, now we get to talk about the fun stuff, like roles and responsibilities as a commissioner. Yay. <laughs> Does anybody need to take a quick break? Okay. Um, oh, Jimmy. Um, <laughs> I'll fill her in when she comes back or next week. So you're basically as a commissioner, you're an advisor to council, our elected officials. You're gathering info, analyzing issues. You're recommending options to city council. City council being the final authority to uh, making policy decisions regarding governance, public issues, and services to the public, which require council approval. Any residents, if you wear your resident hat, you can come to council to offer an opinion about anything. For us, we have a specific focus on DEIA perspective. Um, there's also other advisory bodies um, that provide recommendations to the city. So such as COBAC, that's the, you met John, who was in here is the chair, that's um, City Events um, Accessibility um, Commission. And their purpose of, this, um, of the city being accessible and welcoming community. And they have um, a focus on meeting the letter and intent of the American Disabilities Act, they also have a strategic plan and they're advising council on implementation on that. Another one is the environmental um, climate uh, committee where they're focused on climate action plan, making recommendations on the implementation of that plan. They provide input and evaluation of city policies and action um, related to stewardship of natural resources and environment. And then another one is um, the AHAC or Affordable Housing Advisory Committee and the advice on specific focus like affordable housing. You hear CDBG a lot. That's um, HUD housing, uh, federal housing department program that funds local community development activities um, with goals of providing affordable housing, anti-poverty -pro programs and infrastructure development. So big picture, these are all the different advisory boards with all different focuses. The council has all these advisory bodies that they go to for expertise. Um, it really helps them inform when they're making decisions and they're voting on something. 
The city manager also has his own advisory body, and then the police chief has also an appointed advisory council. And there we are. So, and then the purpose of the HR, HREC and the council voted on this, and this is on our municipal codes, so this is law, that um, there's four purposes for you. Uh, number one is to provide input to the city council on city goals and policies from a DEIA perspective. Create a work plan for diversity, DEIA, and advise the council on implementation, progress, and updates on the plan. And number three is work with the community, interested groups, staff, and elected officials to make recommendations that embrace the city's commitment to building a more inclusive community. And number four, provide opportunities for people seeking resolution and assistance regarding complaints of discrimination including potential violations of the city's equal right ordinance. So HRC, HREC may connect people with resources and assistance and seek resolution of complaints through, my accent's going to come out, conciliatory or educational processes. But we don't have authority to compel participation, require specific actions, or impose economic sanctions and other penalties. So with regards to DEIA work plan, the commission, um, many of you were new, like you were mo one month new and you all just got in, you know, and developed this work plan and turn it around with velocity and got it to council right before the um, council goal setting so we could include it in the strategic plan for the city and then also request for budget. So for that, um, we have uh, four goals that you all develop. There's the, the top four goals, and I'll just read through it, and then I'm going to pass it on to Mayor Pro Tem. She's going to provide us with a, an update on your fruits of your labor. So the top four goals, uh, priorities is number one, to establish a process for community members to have an avenue to share acts of discrimination and offer resources, navigation, and appropriate triaging. Number two, develop an equity framework to be utilized by all city departments in all stages of policy development and decision making. Number three, create community engagement and city council's goal setting process. And number four, provide advice and direction to city council on policy decisions that align with the mission of the HREC. This includes advice on legislative agendas and funding priorities. So I'll pass it on to Mayor Pro Tem to provide an update. Yeah, just a little preview. So we had a day and a half of goal setting with council and staff. Um, and basically, the, we, are, we are planning the next two years, starting in July of, of this year, um, of the work that this, the council and the city are, are going to do. Um, we really looked at sort of, at, I guess, four, four main areas. It was, it was public safety, um, housing and economic development, um, sorry, transportation and infrastructure. And, and infrastructure help me. And then and um, accessible and, and effective government. government. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, it was a long day and a half. Um, <laughs> And um, and, I, and oh, yeah. yesterday, yeah. <laughs> that's why I'm tired. Um, so, so we we everything that is that is on this work plan is something that we not only discussed but but agreed as a group we wanted to move forward. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you for for that. Um, we also have some I I think some really um, um, cool. Uh, for lack of a better word, um, ideas on how to engage better um, as, as a council and as a city that I'm um, looking forward to sharing with you too. But um, yeah, thank you for this. Um, it is in there. And um, yeah. So, um, yeah, and we'll be officially voting on it in March. So it's really two days. So in March, yes. we'll be voting on the overarching framework. The overarching and then framework, yes. The more detailed um, work plan be adopted alongside the budget in June. Got it. Awesome. Yeah. So thank you. So, to share that. <laughs> thank you. All right. So next on the agenda is the chair nomination election process. Um, oh, where did Jasmine go? So Jasmine was our chair um, and we're rotating chair like every year and her term ended in December. So now we get to um, nominate and elect a new chair. And I'll go over um, 
currently the HREC has like five leadership positions and each one of them, there's a one-year term. We're going to focus on the chair tonight because that's vacant one. There's also actually two other vacant ones, but I've been hearing feedback from folks that maybe, um, you know, you could discuss whether you want to continue that because it wasn't exercised, it wasn't acted on and, and um, with the subcommittees potentially um, forming for the work plan coming up, we want to make sure we have um, an efficient, um, you know, making the most of your time with, um, um, you know, not having too many roles and too many meetings. So, but tonight we'll, we'll focus on the chair. Once we have the chair, we'll discuss the other positions. You guys can discuss it as a body. Um, so the chair um, responsibilities is you're presiding at all official meeting of the HREC. You consult with the city staff liaison in drafting the meeting agenda. You keep the discussion orderly, focused, efficient, and personal and fair. And you lead the meetings and facilitate commission decision-making. Um, you're also the lead spokesperson for like council presentation, commis other committees, commissions, and board, media, but you could delegate that. And then you could delegate any tasks to other HREC me uh, members as appropriate during the HREC meeting. The time commitment potentially in the beginning might be a little bit more than this, but ideally we want to get it to the point where it's 30 minutes an hour for pre-prep planning. Um, committee meetings like we have tonight is two hours. And then there's the post-meeting debrief session. Um, for, for other committees that have been doing this for a while now and they've gotten to a routine, it's even gone down to like 30 minutes instead of an hour. Um, then there's the leadership meetings that's um, an hour. And you might be able to merge that with the um, pre-planning and the post meetings so instead of having a separate hour. And then um, also committee members check-ins as needed, which I actually enjoy. I do that a lot with you all. <laughs> it's kind of nice to connect. And then agenda action items as needed. So total about five hours plus or minus is the commitment. And then the chair nomination process um, uh, is what I propose is, you know, think about it. If you want to run to be chair, is you have until Friday, think about it. If you do want to run, submit your name to me, um, provide a short paragraph of why you think you'll be great as a chair for the Human Rights and Equity Commission, and then that you are able to commit for, um, for the time and you have the capacity for that. But then I'll turn it around the following week on Tuesday and summarize all the nom nominees, email it to everybody, and then you all will have about two and a half weeks to de decide who you want to nominate as your chair. And then our, our next um, HREC meeting, which is on um, February 22nd, we could elect the chair and chair. Yeah, I interject. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and this all sounds good. And, and we're not doing a big training on public meetings and public records today. Sad, I know, <laughs> but this all sounds good. I think I'll just sort of underscore that when Mickey says she'll distribute the information and you will all sort of think about how you're deciding, um, do that individually. Do not discuss amongst yourselves. Who do you, you know? What do you think about this person? What do you think about this person? That discussion can happen if the group wants to have it, but it should happen during the next meeting. Mm -hmm. There are public meetings issues, which I won't belabor. But um, Mickey will distribute this information. Do your your contemplation individually, and if if you'd like, be ready to bring thoughts and share with the group at the meeting. That's fine. You don't have to, um, but I would just caution you to. Uh, Remember that there are public meetings laws and that limit what kinds of discussions and deliberations you should be having outside of a noticed public meeting. And um, I'm sure we'll go over the intricacies of that at some point if um, the group thinks it's useful. And if you have any questions, you can find me. But yeah, consider the information on your own and bring your thoughts to the group. Thank you. And yes, yeah, so we're, we're also going to have another a separate meeting for those of you who haven't had that regarding laws on public meetings and public notices ethics as well. And I'll um, share that information as soon as I have it for dates and meeting locations. And meanwhile, I know um, some of you have already looked out, um, looked up old videos and watched Ian and Mary. So you might have some insights to that. Um, 
And that's the end of our agenda item. Oh, wait a minute. No, that's not correct. Uh, Mickey, um, could I could I add some thoughts? Yes, ma'am. On the responsibilities of the chair. I think that um, two things that were not mentioned, but that uh, we have to keep in mind is that we have a work plan. So that person will have, you know, um, will have, you know, that uh, uh, role to inspire all of us to get across the finish line. And then another thing also that comes to mind uh, for the share is that emerging things happen. Um, crises in the community, uh, gosh, you know, uh, things happen. Uh, and so uh, that is something that sort of falls as a responsibility. Um, so, um, so yeah, those are some things that may not be in the official description of the role, but that are, um, you know, things that, uh, that we know are, are upcoming. Thank you so much. Any other comments? Great. So um, next we have um, Sarah Hudson from the Community Development Group. There she is. Um, Hi, Sarah. If, you, if you'd like to introduce yourself, have you been watching? Did you hear us? Uh, you could share as much as you want, like we have. Or you could just introduce yourself, whatever you feel comfortable with. <laughs> oh, sorry. I, I just jumped on a few minutes ago, so I'm not oh, sure okay. what um, introductions you guys were doing. But uh, my name is Sarah Hudson. My pronouns are she, hers, hers. And I'm a senior management analyst in the city manager's office. I'm also the project manager for um, our system development charge methodology update, which is um, why I'm here to talk to you all today. Um, I wanted to explain the project briefly and also looking for um, a liaison from the group um, if, if there's interest and availability. Is it okay if I jump, sure. jump right in? Yes, ma'am. Okay, <clears throat> so um, essentially system development charges, they're um, a notable source of revenue for the city. Um, they're assessed on uh, new construction um, and certain types of redevelopment, and we're in the process of updating our methodologies. So we're updating our transportation and water uh, system development charge methodologies, and we're doing a, a review of our sewer methodologies as well. And the reason that we're undergoing this update is we had recently done master plan updates for the transportation system master plan and also the water system master plan. And you usually do this kind of methodology review um, as part of that process. Um, we identify projects that are um, being built that contribute to um, growth and uh, capacity enhancing improvements in the system. And then we can use those SDC revenues to pay for those projects. Um, and we're going through this process of kind of reviewing everything all in one fell swoop. A lot of times we kind of piecemeal it out, but we wanna have a holistic conversation um, and really look at total impact, total charges, um, bring alignment between those different methodologies because they're all kind of assessed um, differently at this point. Um, we also collect fees on behalf of Ben Park and Rec District. Um, they underwent um, a methodology update recently, a couple years ago. So want to look at how we're kind of structuring our fees to see if there could be consistency um, there as well. So those are some of the things being considered. So as part of this process, we're doing a stakeholder group engagement and um, we've invited about 30 groups so far. So we've gone around to the different advisory bodies for the city to get um, a representative, um, a lot of folks from the development community. Um, I can send out a list of all the organizations that are participating. We're trying to really get um, a, a wide variety of inputs. Um, and essentially the commitment is a meeting a month for um, at least the next 
three months. So we have a February meeting, a March meeting, and an April meeting on the calendar. And then depending on how the discussion goes and if we need more time to work together as a group, we uh, may also meet in May and June. And through those stakeholder group meetings, we want to be able to look at issues of um, policy. We're going to look at how um, how the fees impact things like affordable housing. And then we'll also take into account other areas of impact, like um, should uh, spaces that have more square footage be assessed a higher fee, things like that. So these are all kind of things that will get discussed through that process. Um, I know I ran through that very quickly. Can I answer any questions from the group or, um, or provide any clarification? STCs are confusing, so feel free to ask questions. <laughs> yeah, they, they are. <laughs> yes. Hi, Sarah. Nice Hello. to see you. I know, it's good to see you. Um, question about the actual work group. Mm -hmm. um, you know, being in the Human Rights and Equity Commission, we got to be mindful of power dynamics. And you mentioned that they are uh, developers and uh, folks with some possibly financial interest in that space. So how, uh, how are you bringing that sort of like DI Valley to ground that? Uh, just, you know, I'll be happy to join, you know, if, if somebody wants to, but I just want to make sure that whoever from this group joins is not doing like a heavy lifting to dismantle existing power dynamics, right? Yeah. So, you know, it's a delicate thing to advocate when, when there's money involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's totally a valid point. We tried to be uh, very intentional in terms of having balance in the group. So we asked for each organization that um, is participating to have one representative um, so that there's not kind of an imbalance of um, kind of swaying towards certain interests. Um, we also are working with a consultant team with a great facilitator to kind of help us navigate that and making sure that we can solicit input in a fair um, way and make sure that it, the process works for everyone um, and very open to collecting feedback along the way if, if that process isn't working for folks of how to um, refine it and kind of course correct. Oh, great. I'm glad you have uh, additional support. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So what we were um, talking about, Sarah, is that if people are interested to let me know, okay. and then I would pass it on to Sarah. So um, when do you need to know by Sarah? The first meeting is February 22nd. So I think as long as it's before that, you know, ideally, if it may be within the next week or two that I can get information out or um, provide additional context if it's helpful, because I know some of this is a little bit of a technical discussion, um, although it's certainly not expected that folks would have homework outside of this, but just any information that can be provided so people feel comfortable with the, um, the topic area. Sorry, if I may, I'm sorry. What time and what days you guys meet for how long? Yeah, so, and I can send this information um, out as well, but the meeting dates, um, currently we have Wednesday, February 22nd from 1 to 3 p.m., Thursday, March 16th from 10.30 to 12.30 p.m., Monday, April 10th from 3 to 5 p.m., and then we have kind of tentative dates in May and June. Um, they are during weekdays and work hours, but we try to switch days of the week and then times of day. Um, we're also asking for in-person engagement if folks can do that, but we have a virtual attendance option um, if that feels more doable um, or safer, depending on whatever kind of the current context is. Um, and we'll also provide mechanisms for input if it just feels difficult to uh, make those meeting times. So um, can work with me to kind of provide that info so that I can make sure that it kind of gets funneled into that stakeholder group process. I was wondering the same thing, the February 22nd, same uh, data stage rank meeting, so we'll be back to back. Yeah. 
Can I like target goals for redu- the reduction of fees, or is this just more investigative in terms of how you might be able to re- reduce fees to to create more affordability in the construction process? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it it's probably best phrased as at least kind of a, an exploration because we need to make sure that whatever we do is in alignment with the master planning effort, but SDCs are kind of a, a mechanism, a lever that can be pulled to um, around affordable housing. So we have um, exemptions that we do for affordable housing and childcare facilities. So those facilities don't have to pay certain um parts of the fee um, so that we can kind of incentivize that development. So one thing that we're looking at through this is kind of baking in those exemptions right now that's kind of in our code, but kind of putting it in the the calculation, the methodology itself. Um, All of those things will be explored um, throughout the the course of the project. Um, So um, yeah, the ultimate outcome is just to make sure that there's alignment and that we have that update because we did the master planning update. And then ultimately two goals around transparency, ease of administration. We, we admit that the process is a bit cumbersome at this point, and there's, there's certainly um, goals to help streamline that as well. Thank you. Any other questions? I said no. No? (laughs) All right. Well, Sarah, so what I'll do is I'll request for the body to email me if you're interested. And if there's more than one interest that I could do like a voting system, just like with the, sorry, chair in the um, nomination and election process. And then I could get back to Sarah um, with whoever the body selected. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, everyone. Take care. Thank you. All right, and then next on the agenda is Stephanie. She's going to give us an exciting update about the director recruitment. Before I jump into an update on the director recruitment, I really want to thank Mickey for um, supporting the HVAC, but also our important equity initiatives in the interim. He's not going away quite yet. Um, We still have um, some time before we'll be able to do the recruitment process. So just thank you for everything, Mickey. While we really took a pause to um, evaluate what the needs um, and expectations of the community and the organization are so that we make sure that we're really thoughtful as our next equity um, director. We realized as we were going through this that we needed to enlist um, the expertise and the capacity that an outside consultant could bring to this really important recruitment. So we signed a contract today and we'll be working with Workplace Change. They're Oregon-based and they're minority and women-owned business. And this is their expertise. It is um, recruitments for DEI leaders, as well as helping organizations make meaningful progress in their equity journey. So we're really excited to work with them. Um, We anticipate kicking off the recruitment in the next couple of weeks, and then we'll go through um, that, that recruitment piece, the interviews, we um, expect that um, both council and um, representation from this commission will be part of that selection process. So we'll be providing updates along the way, but I'm just really excited that we are moving forward. And my hope um, that by um, late spring that we have an equity job. Woohoo! <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stephanie. Um, and then next, we pass it on to Lisa for public comments. Uh, we have Joshua Romero. Hey, Joshua Romero. And then um, we have Melina um, Bryan. I don't want to put Joshua on the spot, but Joshua, did you get to um, watch us share with each other earlier? Oh, do. He's gone from the background while he's cooking. Yeah. <laughs> you know that Joshua was in the Wall Street Journal? Yeah. Oh. He's famous. Hi, everyone. Actually, an article about him, about his role. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Um, great to see your wonderful faces. Joshua Romero, uh, he, him pronouns. I'm actually just listening to the meeting. I registered so I could watch it as a member of the community. 
uh, versus as a member of staff. So keep up the great work. I'm excited. So keep moving forward, doing amazing work. Great. Thank you so much. Now we have the responsibility to do work for Joshua. Pay attention. <laughs> Do you have one more question? Uh, yes. Uh, Melina Moran. Yeah, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Melina Moran. I have been listening and I just wanted to introduce myself. Um, I am the chair of the Oregon Commission of Hispanic Affairs and I live locally here in Bend. I'm a nurse practitioner. Um, I work at Best Care Treatment Center. Sorry if you hear children in the back. Um, <laughs> And I just wanted, I'm really excited about this commission here in Bend, and I wanted just to introduce myself so you can know my name, and um, I look forward to being service to you, and um, maybe we could collaborate in the future. So great to meet you. Thank you so much. Well, we could hear people. I know. Awesome. Awesome. Wow, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and that the, the public comments was the last agenda item. We don't have any other items. We're like 10 minutes early. Wow. And I don't want to say goodbye, but is there, you know, does anybody want to say anything before we adjourn? Thank you, Mickey. Yeah. Oh, thank you. We're really grateful. I know it's a question for Stephanie. Uh, and it's kind of related to Kyrie. Uh, you know, Part BI is having um, recruitment and hiring and retention mm -hmm. of underserved uh, communities. Um, so when we look at like our hierarchical system, um, we have the city manager and we have several. Um, Assistant city manager, do we have representation of people of color uh, in, in those more higher uh, escalon? What's the word? In the higher echelon. Yes, thank you. And, and how you know how can we do? How, what can we do to encourage that um, that representation and voice? You know, and all levels of uh, city government. Absolutely. And our goal is to have a city staff that represents the community that we serve. And so right now in sort of that, that city manager, um, yeah. yes, that the, the, the top of the pyramid. The top. Um, I will get some data for you on the overall organization. It's actually on the city's dashboard, um, but it's not broken down by um, kind of that hierarchy position. It's broken down by department. But I can say with kind of the city manager and assistant city manager, um, in those four positions, there is not a person of color. There are two women that are in those leadership roles. Okay. As we go down to the, the next tier um, of our directors, we um, absolutely have more diversity in that. But again, it is a process and it is our goal to make sure that we have greater representation in leadership roles across the organization. And um, maybe it will be a topic for a future um, meeting, but we have been putting some programs in place to really help people meet these goals and be successful when they're there. So how do we provide promotional opportunities and retain the talented workforce that we have so that we have future leaders that can take us forward? Absolutely. It's great to have those pathways. I will tell you, work experiences where Promotions happen and they're not even announced to, to folks of color. So it's great to know that we're working and thinking about it. If only two folks get to go to leadership and from the entire city of city of Bennett and the dean, and I'm, I'm able to do that. So that's part of that kind of leadership pipeline uh, that we're trying to like build. So I'm thankful that for that as well. Yeah. Good question, Chris. I don't want to end up in a bad note, but uh, one of the functions of the community is to work or try to help in cases of discrimination issues, complaints. What's the mechanism to capture those? And how do we know about it? And who's involved in that process? 
We just talked about that. <laughs> it's actually, that, that's what we talked about in goal setting is, 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 is figuring out how to do that and how to do that well, um, you know, in, with, with the assistance of the Human Rights and Equity Commission um, with our, with the, you know, in our next goal, um, next biennium. So yeah, that's something that, that I don't think we've quite figured out how to, how to do um, yet. And, and so the plan is, is that a process or is that TBD? Um, TBD. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's, I'm, 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 there's several processes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Too, that's that's um, our police department yes. has a process for hate and bias yes. incidents. Because uh, I, I was under the understanding we didn't have anything. And Mary and the legal department was quickly to correct me. <laughs> but also, <laughs> the Oregon Department of Justice has a process. Yeah. So part of our work in these upcoming biennium, these two years, will be to bring those pieces together yes. um, and, and build from it to, to create mm -hmm. something that is really working for the people. Yeah. So, so that's like one, one of the top four goals in the work mm -hmm. plan. And that's the next step we're going to be working on in February and March. We're going to look at what, what are the next steps? What are the action items under this? And what are the resources we need? How does that align with council goals? How does it fit in? So um, we'll, we'll be, um, you will be creating subcommittees to have different focuses. So. Yeah, and, and not creating a new system, but but yeah, how can we how can we connect with the existing systems and how can we provide more support as a city um, to people? Can we be a connector? Can we be a convener? Can yes. we, how can we, how can we? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what it is. He's all. I'll throw my name in there. <laughs> That's the way to go. Yeah, subcommittees are going to be popping up to basically execute the action items on the action. Um, and and this reminds me: Can we get the copy dates back on? We had a body system uh, where different commissioners, because we cannot be all together in groups to discuss public things but we can go and have coffee and get to know a little bit more about the communities we serve or the communities we're in touch with. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps a little bit to, you know, all of us can be more prepared when something is. I would love the, I don't know what organized, but um, I, was I could say Andrea was. Andrew, yeah. <laughs> but, the but I think Manoj, it was still. Yeah. Like, Manojo's yeah, part of it. Or maybe like let him know that we would like that to go back into place again. Great. All right. Well, it is six twenty-seven. You got three more minutes. Anything else? Anybody else wants to share? All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. This was an amazing meeting. It's really great getting to know all of you at a deeper level, and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. 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 He's got the, um, I don't know, 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 I don't